Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildred, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. I've said multiple times that D&D is a victim of its own traditions. I know that it sounds repetitive, but as long as it keeps happening, I'm going to keep saying it. From the mage, non-mage gap, also known as linear warriors, quadratic wizards, the spell charges, the jank that is alignments, the indecisive approach to fantasy, the D20 system, as shown in D&D, is not the perfection that it's argued to be. This is why I've had more fun with other people's take on the D20 system rather than the official material, at least when it came to 3rd edition. 5th edition's jury's out there. By not having people directly associated with those traditions working on the game, they could go in directions the core material can't, or at least not without controversy from the traditionalists. See Tome of Battle. The big exception to this is Pathfinder, which I never really got on the bandwagon because for me, it didn't really try to address D20's shortcomings, it just slapped a bandage on them. And the upcoming 2nd edition seems to have continued that trend. Of course, it didn't help matters that a different take on D20 beat it to the punch for me. Which brings us to today's subject matter, Fantasy Craft. The high fantasy sister to Spycraft 2.0, Fantasy Craft aims to blow up the D20 system and rebuild it from scratch. Does it hold up? Well, let's find out. At 402 pages, Fantasy Craft is an incredibly dense book. Not due to walls of text or anything like that, but just the sheer amount of mechanics and material that it packs within it. The interior art is all black and white, but the art style presented seems designed for it. More importantly, it presents a consistent visual identity throughout that's only undone by some of the charts interrupting the book's flow. Even without that issue, there are only a few finer points where I felt I had to do a significant amount of book jumping, and of course, a very thorough index. Fantasy craft can be deceptive to those familiar with the D20 system, and there's no better demonstration of that than in character creation. We'll be showing this with our example character in Vaughn. Now the first step is attributes, which is generated via point spending instead of die rolls. We have 36 points to spend on these 6 attributes, and to that end we'll allocate them as follows. Strength 15, Dexterity 12, Constitution 14, Intelligence 11, Wisdom 12, and Charisma 13. Second is Origin, which is a somewhat expanded version of race in its contemporaries. Origin is comprised of race and specialty in this case. This is further complicated by the human pick in our case, meaning we have to pick a talent as well. To that end, we'll go with Human for Race, Strong for Talent, and Fencer for Specialty. Strong grants us a plus two to Strength, Double Boost on Strength checks, Improved Stability, and the Shove trick. Fencer grants us the Fencing Basics feat, a plus five Initiative bonus, the Edge proficiency, plus ten feet to Speed, and the Parry trick. Third is Class, which is mostly self-explanatory, even with the fact that most classes presented here don't work entirely like their contemporaries. We'll be going with Soldier, which grants its class skills, 4 skill points, a vitality of 14, and 6 proficiencies. Instead of having weapons preset based on class, each class has a number of proficiencies that can be spent to learn weapon types, or get a forte in that type, giving a plus 1 to attack and damage, or to gain advanced actions. We'll spend 3 of that for the Edge Forte, Blunt Proficiency, Unarmed Proficiency, Relentless Attack, Ragged Wound, and Salt the Wound, the last three being Tricks. The Soldier class also grants the Accurate ability and one additional combat feat. We'll go with Sword Basics, which grants the ability to anticipate after attacks, and the Martial Spirit Stance. For extra feat being level 1, we'll go with Darting Weapon. Fourth is Skills. Now in addition to the list of class skills from Soldier, we can pick two additional ones that are treated as Origin Skills and thus can have it ranks invested in them on a one-to-one -one basis, much like class skills. We've got four points to spend, and we'll put one rank each in Athletics, Notice, Resolve, and Tactics. Fifth is Interests, Fantasy Craft's answer to knowledge skills from D20 proper. Interests take one of three forms, Language, Alignment, and Study. We'll start with a Language from the character's native home rant, one Study, and two Free Picks that can be one of the three. We'll have Common as our Language, and three Studies. Dueling, Warfare, and Guild Politics. As a result, when making a knowledge check, we'll roll our total studies and add intelligence. In this case, a plus three. Lastly, gear. At first level, we start out with 100 silver, which we'll spend on a Scholar's Sword, 
studded leather armor, a grappling hook, and a canteen. The only issue I have with character creation is the point-based attribute parts. I've never been a fan of point distribution like this, as I've always preferred random generation when it comes to the D20 system. I understand why it's done in this fashion, but it still irks me. There's a lot of small details I skimmed over here, but the point I wish to demonstrate are the numerous aspects of customization throughout character creation, instead of merely being rooted on race and class. This is not a game meant to have the prototypical basic fighter or similar one-trick ponies, and in my opinion, all the better for it. As you can see, customization is going to be a thing here, and that's not just in terms of players. Fantasy Craft may use a heavily modified D20 system, but it's still the same core you'll be familiar with if you've played or seen any iteration of D&D. The first point of deviation is adding an extra effort mechanic with action dice. At the start of an adventure, you begin with a certain amount based on your level and gain them as a GM award. This starts at 3d4 at 1st level and goes up to 4d6 at 6th level, 5d8 at 11th, and 6d10 at 16th. These can be spent to either add to a die roll, boost defense, activate a threat or an error into a critical, or to heal during combat. Skills work mostly the same as they do in classic D20, but some like Sense Motive and Athletics have combat usage as well. Also, instead of having a series of subtypes for crafting, Every four ranks in the crafting skill grants you a focus in a particular subject, and writing works in a similar fashion. These focuses can be upgraded into a forte if you so choose. This is still rooted in the skill points issue that I've had with D&D 3.5, but I appreciate that the skill bloat isn't as much of a problem here. Feats, on the other hand, are far, far more organized than they've been in other D&D iterations. Categorized as combat, gear, spellcasting, and so on. This means that classes like the Soldier don't need to list off individual bonus feats and instead can just point to a specific category for them when getting bonus feats. Furthermore, most feat chains are only three parts long and arranged in a Basics, Mastery, Supremacy format. The cherry on top of feat usage is that many of the feats, especially combat ones, are multi-purpose, often granting a passive benefit as well as a trick or stance to utilize. The ones that aren't typically shy away from being merely a situational bonus. To that end, Every feat matters. Combat is radically different here than in D20 proper. For starters, instead of having the multiple action types, you may either perform a full action or two half actions. The core rules for attacks and damage aren't too different from the core, but damage has a few changes. First, instead of hit points, Fantasy Craft uses vitality and wounds, much like in Unearthed Arcana, as well as the previously reviewed Dungeons and Delvers. Speaking of previously reviewed D20 games, Damage to mooks and non-lethal damage work similar to the damage saves in Mutants and Masterminds, treated as a saving throw with the attack roll acting as the difficulty. Critical damage is also different, being rooted in the spending of action die as I mentioned before. Spending one action die will convert damage from vitality to wounds, whereas spending two action dice will make it inflict a critical injury, even if it doesn't hit the 25 point threshold. While this might imply that combat is more lethal, that's not entirely the case. It's more to show that there's always an angle to be taken in combat. Fantasycraft's combat ultimately favors the tactical over the repetitive. It might get a bit crunchy, but its crunch is by design. There's several other aspects that Fantasycraft delves into, such as how adventuring has its own currency and reputation, which can be spent on magic items, favors, holdings, and renown. All this may appear overwhelming, but I do appreciate that the time spent outside of the adventure is just as important as the time spent in it. It's a fine counter-argument to the murder-hobo stereotype. Normally, I'd cover magic use in the mechanics section, but Fantasy Craft treats magic as an optional part, not an assumption. And this option is usually based on the GM's campaign quality system. Yes, even the GM's rules can be customized in this game. Anyways, instead of Arcane and Divine Casters having separate spell lists, Fantasy Craft is more freeform. We'll start with Arcane spells, since that's going to have the bulk of it. First, spellcasting itself is a skill roll. Putting aside that it determines how many spells you may know, barring ones from other effects, the spellcasting roll is used to cast spells. The difficulty is determined by the spell, and casting requires an expenditure of spell points. It should be noted that if you fail the roll, you essentially waste the spell point. Divine casters, on the other hand, do not have a spell list and do not use spellcasting checks. Instead, they have a series of paths as determined by their alignment. These paths are typically class features that have five steps, and some may not even grant spells. 
The ones that do treat that spell as a per-combat or per-scene affair most of the time. In a sea of fantasy games that treat magic as something above those who can't cast it, I appreciate that this game doesn't fall into the magic assumption problem. On the back of the book is Fantasy Craft's motto, Your Dungeon, Your Dragon, Your Way. And by God do they mean it. I've seen some compare this to GURPS, and while I feel that comparison is somewhat unfair, I can understand it to a very small extent. There are a few aspects that can't be tweaked in one form or another in this game. Even the time outside the adventure is valued, as I said before. Furthermore, this game is being made with as few assumptions as possible. It's clearly a fantasy game, but it's not interested in just being the Tolkien melting pot, but something that's potentially for multiple subgenres of fantasy without using the fluff defense. That said, there is a lot, and I mean a lot, that I skimmed over. Magic item creation, weapon and armor customization, detailed monster creation that scales with level, the campaign quality system that lets the GM tweak the rules permanently or temporarily. Fantasy Craft is tailor-made for those people who like to house rule and tweak small and large things within the game. But there is the elephant in the room. This is not a game that works for those who like a self-contained experience. That freedom means broader work requirement for both the GM and the player. If it isn't obvious by now, Fantasy Craft gets a stamp of strongly recommended. It still remains one of my favorite takes on D20, without most of the things that annoy me about D20. If you're the type who has a dozen house rules and likes to make your own settings instead of using established ones, this is for you. If I would add one caveat, it's to get this alongside the Adventure Companion, and possibly as many of the Call to Arms PDFs as you can get. I think there's still a bundle of them available. The former adds three micro settings that can show the breadth of the game's potential, while the latter adds in a bunch of classes to utilize on top of the ones in the core book, especially since master classes aren't in that book. Either way, this game is a classic case of a mantra that I've been fond of for the longest time. The best D&D experiences don't have the name D&D. Stay frosty, everybody.